Well, welcome everybody. Um, our topic today is, uh, th there's so many different ways we can look at this topic today. So, so know that this isn't a complete look at it, but we're gonna look at what, what it means to have two person thinking early in recovery. And I wanna talk about a dynamic that I see almost 100% of the time for at least some amount of time early in recovery. So, so think if either of these sound familiar to you, if you are an addicted person in recovery, have you ever thought, so I have to do whatever my partner says in order for trust to be built, is that right? And I have to do it forever. Um, if you're a person in early recovery, has that ever crossed your mind? If you're someone who's been betrayed, has that ever crossed your mind? They have to do whatever I say in order for trust to be built. And that's how this is gonna work. Um, or on the flip side, um, if you are a betrayed spouse, have you ever thought, so I'm just supposed to hold on because my partner's brain is broken and they can't give me what I need? Um, how unfair is that? Has that ever crossed your mind as a betrayed partner? Or as an addicted person, have you ever felt the shame come on and say, um, I'm not cut out for relationships, I can't do this, I'm just torturing everybody you know, that I'm in contact with? Um, and this really sucks to be everybody who's in a relationship with me. Um, I see those two ways of thinking come up a lot. Like I said, almost 100% of the time, at least for some period of time early in recovery. And um, sometimes the individuals and couples I work with, they don't ever really find their way out of that dynamic. Um, I want to offer an alternative to that. Um, essentially, what, what both of these ways of thinking indicate is one person thinking and especially, essentially it comes down to when is it going to be my turn? And we, we turn into, this, this is not to disparage anybody because I know that the hurt is real and what we do out of a hurt place isn't usually our best, but essentially what this can turn into is like fighting over your place in the line for the drinking fountain when you're in first grade or kindergarten. When is it gonna be my turn? And the focus becomes on fairness and when I get mine, or um, for, for some other couples or individuals, it, it boils down to an argument over who's going to be in charge here, um, which is another one person way of looking at a relationship, who's in charge, who calls the shots. I hear this a lot from my addicted folks that I work with of a certain attachment type. Um, I don't have any power here. My partner makes all the decisions. We're doing this because this is what they want. Um, both of those are a, a distorted view, or I would say they're not a complete view. If you really have a relationship, if the goal really is for two people to think in a way that benefits both of them, um, that way of thinking for either party is really problematic. And it also doesn't provide a very good path forward. Um, and and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So for the addict in recovery who thinks, great, so I just have to do whatever my partner says um, in order for them to trust me, and this is never going to end. The person who thinks that way has very little motivation to look closer at what their partner is asking for and why, and to understand not just what a book says about what's going on, but why their partner feels the way that they do. Um, there's an opportunity there when you look closer at what's going on for your partner and understand why they do what they do or why they're asking for what they're asking for, why they need what they need. Um, if the understanding becomes apparent, it is really easy for you to get on board um, with what that person is asking. You can figure out why that's a good idea for you. Um, an example of how that works in relationships, that whole, you know, looking and understanding what this means so you can get on board. Um, so both of my older boys, 10 and 13, they've been involved in music lessons for a couple of years. My 10 year old plays the drums. My 13 year old started on the ukulele. And um, a few months ago, my 13 year old came to us and he said, I think I want to move to the guitar and I want to, I want to play electric guitar. Um, and uh, he said, I'd, I'd like you guys to buy me a guitar and an amp and, you know, what I need. And uh, it really, it really didn't take a lot of time for us to think that through and say, yes, this is a good idea because we've observed this kid practice. 
Um, he, you know, was showing some skill. He had been talking to us for a while about, I feel like I'm kind of getting to, he, he's not a ukulele master by any means, but he said, I feel like I'm kind of running into a ceiling with what I can learn on the ukulele and I'm ready for something else. Um, it was easy to get on board with his request because that context was really apparent to us. Now, my son who plays the drums, his style of approaching his lessons is a little different. He loves his drum teacher. He loves learning things. He loves playing with his drum teacher. Practicing at home is not his thing. Um, he has an old drum set that we bought secondhand. We've got the dampeners on it. Like it's adequate for him to practice, but he doesn't like doing it on his own. So he faithfully goes to lessons every week. He doesn't complain, but um, we don't ever hear his drums. So he approached us a couple months after his brother got a new electric guitar and an amp. And he said, I want an electronic drum set. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, it, it is just what it is. It's a, there's some pads and when you hit it with a drumstick, it makes the sound, you can plug in headphones and, um, you know, it's, it's a really good option. There's professional musicians who use electronic drum sets. And his argument was it will take up less space in my room. And um, my drum set won't make noise when I practice. <laughs> now, on the surface of that, we looked at that and we said, you're crazy. Your drum set doesn't make noise because you don't play it. And um, I could see why you would want it to take up less room because it takes up a significant corner of your room. But it's fine, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned right now, if you don't want your drum set to take up room, you should sell it and just not have a drum set because you don't use it at home. And um, that was really, I, I didn't respond that way totally to him, but to say, no, we're not gonna do that. He was really confused. And we could have taken it down the road of, why are you even asking for that? That's ridiculous, can't you see? And instead we took it down the road of, why don't you explain this to me? Like, let's talk about it more. Where are you coming from? And as he started to talk about some of his reasons, um, and we started talking about some of our reasons for saying no, we actually reached a, uh, we negotiated something that was going to work well. I told him I wanted to, I wanted him to bank so many hours of practice and he could take as much time as he wanted to. But once he banked this amount of practice, that we could get him an electronic drum set. And he understood where we were coming from. We understood, you know, originally my number was really high. It was going to take him like two years because <laughs> that's how I operate. And as, as he described how that felt to him and how he thought he would never make it, again, I was understanding where it was come from and we could shape and mold what we were doing to get an arrangement in our relationship that, that works. Everybody's going to get what they need. Um, so... Um, the one way, the one person way of thinking is about me. It's about what I want and I want it fast. And, and I say that again, not in a lot of judgment or disgust. It's with a lot of compassion. When we're in pain, that's what we can see. Also, when we're in pain, we're not really great at doing things that help our relationship. Even if we haven't decided whether we want to stay or not, a lot of times when we're in pain, we can do things that actually undermine our partner's ability or our, our partner's motivation to say, yes, this relationship is a good idea for me and I wanna stay around. So I wanna present a way that this, this whole, like I have to do what my partner says in order to build trust or my partner's brain is broken and I won't get what I need. I wanna present a way that you can hold that in a two person system and actually take a lot of the back and forth out of it. And essentially what I see it as is, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna present a way where you can start working as a partnership wholeheartedly on what both people need early in recovery and not experience it as whose turn is it and um, who's in charge here. So nearly 100% of the time I see that line of thinking. Um, when I see uh, couples fighting early on over what they need, um, that fight over resources is 100% a one person thinking type thing. So, you know, for example, where I live in Utah, um, we are, I think we're the second driest state in the country. Now, if you drive through neighborhoods and cities, you would not know that to look at our landscaping. We all grow big Kentucky bluegrass lawns. 
Now, um, Kentucky bluegrass, believe it or not, comes from Kentucky. And the climate in Kentucky is quite different from Utah. Um, my understanding is a lot of places black, back east where you see these big lawns, they don't have sprinkling systems because the environment waters the grass, like the grass is appropriate for the environment. So last summer was kind of the, the peak so far of this mega drought. And then this winter we had record breaking snow and there's still talk about like water wise landscaping and not using so much water. But like last year at this time, it was like everybody prepare for your lawn to die. And, you know, there may come a time where we get word from the utility that uh, all of the secondary water, the non-treated water is going to be cut off. There's just not any to use. And it was interesting to hear my friends and neighbors talk about it. Some people were very like, yes, this makes sense, should have happened a long time ago. Like, I'm actually looking forward to this as kind of a motivator to get things where they need to be. And then you'd hear some people say, why does this person or this organization, why do they get water and I don't? A fight over resources is always a one person system thing. Um, I, I actually read some studies that indicated that if, if simply all Kentucky bluegrass was taken out of homes and something more water wise was put in, we would have a, enough water for two to three times the population that currently lives along the Wasatch Front or that corridor, that Salt Lake corridor. Um, so again, this like if we if we think in a collective or a two person way, there's actually plenty to go around. There and and the adjustments that need to be made, they're not even nonsense adjustments. They make a lot of sense. This plant doesn't belong here. Why would we water it and keep it here? Like let's get stuff that's you know, beautiful stuff that's designed to be here. So um, you have to remember that in a relationship, every individual's problem is a relationship problem because there's an impact on the relationship and it doesn't matter who or what caused it. If you are together, any problem your partner has and the suffering as a result is a problem for both of you. Think about it this way. What if your spouse is in a motorcycle accident? Now, I grew up in a home with a mother who was a nurse, and the line on motorcycles is motorcycles are stupid and people who ride them are stupid. Why would you, you know, sit on top of a motor with no pr protection and recklessly drive? So if that's, if that's your view and your spouse is taking a motorcycle ride and they crash and they're seriously injured, are you going to only think about how inconvenient that is for you and what an idiot your spouse is and how you wish they'd never gotten on the bike in the first place? And um, maybe even have a part of you that says, you know what, this person is just so dumb, so consistently, it would kind of be nice if they died. Is that all you're going to think? If those thoughts do come up, again, it's very understandable. There's nothing wrong with that. But is that the only way you're going to think about your spouse? My guess is probably not. There may be that part of you and there may be another part of you that says, this really sucks for them. This has just changed their whole life. They're really hurt. We're going to need to be fitting in physical therapy. And, you know, we may need to make some adjustments to our lifestyle and our home because of, you know, this person might be in a wheelchair now or whatever. Or on the flip side, what if your spouse was hit by a car and it wasn't their fault? How would you respond to that? Let's say that they lose their ability to walk and it's going to be very inconvenient for both of you. Are you going to sit and think about how your spouse shouldn't have been in the road in the first place? Or if they were just stronger, you know, maybe they could push a little harder and they wouldn't have to be in a wheelchair. Again, it might be natural if those thoughts come up, it'd be very understandable, but that's probably not the only thing you're going to think about your spouse. Now, in either one of those scenarios, if what you think is, gosh, now this person's a burden, you might want to look at what goes on inside of you when someone outside of you has needs. Because that is a problematic stance for a relationship. If the only thing I can think of is my inconvenience and what is this going to mean for me? I'm not saying don't think about that. All. I'm saying if it's the only thing you can think about, you might have some difficulty to begin with being in relationships. Again, I think the, the more um, nuanced or the, the more relationship positive way of thinking is, yes, this sucks for me, this is inconvenient, and 
my partner is really in a bad way and we're going to have to figure out how to support each other. Even if you're the person who was in the motorcycle accident or hit by the car, you may have a lot of woe is me and that's very understandable. You might also have this part of you that looks at, you know, what is going to happen to the people around me? And, you know, if my life needs to change, um, what's that going to be like for the people around me? And, you know, for, for example, it may not be your preference to give up driving a car, but maybe you are not able to drive a car without great accommodation. And so maybe one of the things you look at is, you know what, I'm going to get good at public transit for a while. It's a little more equipped um, for, for people in my position. And I don't want my partner to have to run around and be my chauffeur. So there's going to be some, some self-sufficiency things, or there's going to be some things I can do that I'm going to look at to both help myself and make my partner's life easier. Again, there's two person think there can be two person thinking from either perspective there. Um, so what we are, um, the, the, the way out of this one person thinking and the continual tug of war is this phrase right here, what are we going to do about this? Now that doesn't, we is not code for the more capable one of us. We is not code for I'm and my partner needs to do some stuff about it. We is really we. When you start thinking in that way, you can take something like, let's say you've been keeping secrets about your sexual behavior for decades and your partner has recently discovered and they're furious at you. And um, you are new to recovery. Um, and you feel a lot of shame every time uh, your, your partner brings up what you've done. Um, what are we going to do about this is really helpful. Because what that starts to do is it can put you both in a position where the shame is not made any worse by playing the game of, it's not just whose fault is it, it's if, if it's not my fault, I don't have to do anything about it. You know, back to the car accident or the motorcycle accident. Just imagine if that is the response to that. Well, I didn't ask for this, so I don't have to do anything about it. That's a really dark, helpless, dead end place to be. When we put our minds together, okay, I've betrayed you. I've lied to you. What are we going to do about it? You might be able to craft together. Okay, here are the individual needs you have. You're going to need some support. Um, you're going to be angry. We have to find a way to, for both of us to be able to deal with the anger that you have. Um, I certainly need help because I've kept secrets for decades and maybe didn't think twice about it, something off about that. Um, all of a sudden, a conversation that may have just been this barrage back and forth of how awful my partner is and why don't they get better, it becomes this comprehensive plan between two people. We're in a place of brokenness and mistrust and anger. Is that really what we want our relationship to be going forward? I would say for most people, their answer is no, of course I don't want this to be my relationship going forward. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we're going to address the needs that we both have. I'm angry. I don't trust you. I'm going to have to figure out what needs to be done about that. And as the person who's done betraying, I'm going to have to facilitate that. Um, there's a lot of guys that I work with, um, early in recovery who, you know, going to marriage therapy is the last thing they want to do because they already feel the shame and the guilt. I know I've messed up and I don't want that looked at anymore. What if looking at that closer and being able to develop a narrative between the two of you about what happened and what we're going to do about it? What if that is a way forward? I've seen some people I work with get that. Okay. This is really hard for me. The last thing I want to do, but you know what? I'm going to show up and we're going to talk it through because we're in a position where we need that kind of help. Um, this, this way we make sure that we're not heaping extra shame on it or worse yet playing shame hot potato. Well, if you would, well, if you would, again, like that to-do list for our relationship, if that ends with only one person having things to do. Again, it doesn't matter how we got here. It doesn't matter who did what to get here. Early in recovery, again, you think that this is triage. Can you imagine if paramedics arrived on a scene of a, you know, a, a 
pedestrian motor vehicle accident. And it was very clear that the pedestrian was hit because they darted out into a dark road. Can you imagine any paramedic who would pay attention to the driver first when there's someone um, who sustained more damage, even if it's by their own fault? No, everybody gets assessed. Everybody gets looked at. We make a plan for everybody. Um, when couples can take an inventory of what they're dealing with, there's trauma, there's mistrust, there's sensitivity, there's PTSD, there's crankiness because I'm withdrawing. There's a lack of direction because my life has just been, you know, put in the, um, the dryer and I'm all confused and disoriented. When you can take an inventory of what we're dealing with right now, not whose fault is it? Don't get me wrong, what happened and who did what, that is important. But if you find that's all you get hung up on and you're playing hot potato with it, you have to give that narrative a rest for a minute. Because the reason why we get caught up in that narrative is because there's pains and there's hurts that aren't dealt with yet. So looking at what's happened, what's the inventory of what we're dealing with, and then we decide what are we together going to do about this? Now, together is an interesting word here because sometimes it means both of us need to come together and do this. Other times together means, you know what? You need to go to a meeting every day. And that's going to be rough. We're, we're not used to that. So together, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we have an environment where you getting to a meeting every day can happen. You may need to go and look up the numbers for the meetings and try out the meetings and find the ones that you like. I may need to um, clear some space in myself or prepare myself for you're going to be gone for an hour every day. Or you're going to be unavailable for at least an hour every day. And then me as the person who's going to the meeting, I need, may need to come back and realize that extra hour has taken a toll on my spouse. So there's going to be some makeup work to do, not because I'm bad or I'm being punished, but because as we're arranging for, for us to get what we need, um, something has to come from somewhere. Or, you know, for a partner who's been betrayed and there's that acute PTSD and there's lots of anger and disorientation. Okay, what we need is we need room for this right now. Because you have to complete your you have to complete your your response cycle. You're having a fight response coming up, and one of the worst things I can do for you is tell you to put a lid on it because it's uncomfortable for me. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure we clear time, we clear space. When the anger's up, we we get into a stance with each other where I can hear it and you can express it, and we take care of each other in that way. And after we might be exhausted and we might need to call our sponsors or we might need to journal or we might need to take a break from each other. But again, we've talked about this in our plan and we're working through together, but we both play a different role. Um, that's what I mean by the inventory of what we're dealing with. A lot of times I'll see couples, well, I don't want to deal with the anger. I have a history with that or that's uncomfortable. Um, anger and trauma response has to be dealt with. There's no way around it. Your body has to complete the response. And I see individuals and couples do much better when they talk together, when they plan together. This is how we are going to address that. It makes it so that recovery is not anybody's uh, single responsibility. It makes it so healing is not just a one-person job because it never really is a one-person job. Again, even if you didn't do anything wrong um, or even if you didn't know what you were doing, or even if you started this behavior when you were five years old and it's just been how you've coped your whole life. Um, when you see a mess in your relationship, it's good for both of you to take stock about what you're going to do about it together. Much better than playing shame hot potato or blame hot potato. So that's, that's the topic for today. Um, thank you, John. Um, great. Great topic. Um, type some questions in, in the Q&A. We've got one there um, already, but um, type them in because uh, we have plenty of time left. Um, I, of course, I scribbled uh, on my sheet here, as I always do. Um, I, I just want to reiterate some of the things you said. Um, when one person has a problem, it's a problem for the relationship. It's a problem for both people. And if we can take that approach, then we do this two-person thinking. Um, it's when we throw the potato back and forth and say, no, your fault, your fault, your fault. 
Um, I love that, you know, the question is, what are we going to do about this? We identify a problem. What are we going to do about this? Um, you know, one of the things I find myself saying is fight the problem, not each other. And I think just what are we going to do about this is like, here's the problem. What are we going to do about it? Let's fight the problem, not each other. We are on the well, same And just an additional note about that in my experience in working with betrayal and sex addiction, if what we are going to do about this turns into a one-step solution, probably not a good solution. Well, you're going to go to meetings and get sober. Yep, really important. Probably not going to fix it all. Well, you're going to stop being critical of me and you're going to be patient with me. Yep, good ingredient, but not going to fix the whole thing. So um, sometimes what we're going to do about this, we can use that to cloak <laughs> this like, we can, we can use it to, to go cloak and dagger and really just put in a dig for a partner then that instead of really thinking about um, you are here on the map and we need to get here. And that's actually a very multi-step complex process. We're, we're not just looking for one answer. We're looking for a comprehensive plan that can actually address the things that we need. Yeah. And, and every, the obvious stuff is yes, you're going to go to, you're going to get into recovery. You're going to get sober. But as you mentioned earlier, like it's not just an hour a day meetings. I mean, sometimes people go to treatment or sometimes people fly to, you know, another part of the country to do a workshop with you for three or four days. There's money spent, there's time, there's, you know, it brings up other things that need to be resolved. Um, it kind of snowballs, like where does the money come from? You know, who's going to take care of the kids while you're away? You know, all, all of that has to be addressed. And, and you know, what are we going to do when you come back? And, you know, you're in a, headspace where you know, basically been opened up and all your trauma is simmering at the surface and things like that. Yeah. Um, so this is, I, I guess my point here, and, and I'd like to ask you about it. This is an ongoing process where <laughs> we continually have to deal with not only the issue, which is the, the addiction or the cheating, but all of the attendance things that come up with that. Yeah. Um, and it, so I was going to say, it's definitely an ongoing issue. And, and again, the, the we around it is not one of us comes up with an idea that the other agrees to. Whenever I'm working couples on this, like, what are you two going to do about this? Some things that I look for, do I hear two voices in the problem solving process? Right. Um, do I see back and forth or are we each just, you know, making our pitch and the other is either accepting or shooting it down? Do we ever take a pitch and kind of mold it and modify it together again? Um, do we see two sets of fingerprints on this? Yeah. Yeah. I um, love the example you gave with your son of the drum kit. It's like, okay, you know, here's what you think. Here's what we think. Let's make something that works for both of us. And yeah, yeah. Um, good parenting is good relationship. I mean, you know, good relationship, it, you know, takes work. Yeah. Um, so, okay, let's jump into the questions. Yeah. Um, my husband has not acted out in 2.5 years, and I believe we love each other very much. Great. We get along well when we are off doing fun things together. However, if I am in any type of pain from memories of betrayal or any hard subjects, he seems to shut down, and I feel all alone. Um, how do I deal with this feeling of being alone if he's not able to be there for me? Very good question. Yeah, it is a really good question. The first, the first thing I look at there is um, the not able. Um, I have to deal with this all the time with couples that I work with, and I, I have to find out whether people are able or not. Um, there have been some really extreme cases where I have found out, I know this person's not capable of empathy or not capable of appropriate response. And that usually has to do with, like there can be some neurodiversity issues. There could be impairments with like, you know, some people, uh, the, the condition's called propopagnosia and it's uh, the inability to distinguish faces. And people with propopagnosia, they have a really hard time responding empathetically because they can't read human faces. So, so the can't, positions are usually there's an extreme condition that means we can't everything else 
it's not a matter of not able to or can't. It's either distracted by or not motivated to. Now, not motivated to doesn't mean I don't love you enough or I don't want you enough. Sometimes it means this pain is really big and I haven't found my why that's big enough to help me deal with the pain of doing this. So that's the first place that I would start is in situations like this, when I'm, when I'm doing marriage therapy, I ask people, do you want to be there for your partner in the way they're asking you to? Um, when your partner talks about their pain and needing your help, does that sound good to you in any way? Is there any part of you that wants that? And most of the time, what I hear from people is, yeah, I'd love to be able to do that, or I think that would be good. So, so starting with is the motivation there, I think is really helpful. And then when I'm working with these couples, we get into, okay, what exactly happens when this comes up? Um, sometimes what, what couples can miss is the way that it's brought up or the timing that it's brought up um, or you know, our presentation to each other. Like It just brings up a lot of fear in each other, and not because we're trying to do that, but because there's a lot of fear around us for us. So sometimes we can clean up the approach and we can clean up the way that both of you are handling it initially. And then all of a sudden this partner who we didn't think can do this can totally do it and is really good at it. Um, but I, I think it starts with the, what's our vision together? Um, it's like, uh, Scott, you had, had talked about earlier, we, we kind of have to look at these relationship issues as we're always gonna be dealing with them in some way. And having that unified vision of when this stuff comes up, like you talk about the pain and the memories from betrayal, that's real. And you'll probably be dealing with that in some way for the rest of your life. So the two of you looking at together is what we're doing with this. Is this really where we want to end up? Would we like something different? And if you have a vision of something different, a vision together of something different, that can usually start to leverage some of that. I shut down or I freeze, or I'm not good at this, or I don't think I can. That can usually leverage some of that into, instead of thinking about I can't, it's I have to. Well, what else would I be doing? Why else would I do anything different? Um, there's, there's some work that, uh, there's, there's some work around the, the frame of reference. There's some work around the underlying assumptions that I would say to, to get to there. Yeah, and I would also add, um, you know, addicts, we are shame-based people. I mean, it's shame, and, you know, that's the master emotion that drives the bus. Um, we don't like to feel any kind of emotional discomfort, which is why we're addicts. We escape our pain. Um, and until we do work on our underlying issues, our underlying trauma that created our shame, we're still carrying it around. Um, two and a half years in, He's still struggling with pain, you know, not even his pain, your pain. I'm wondering if he's done, you know, therapy that, that goes beyond getting sober. I mean, getting sober and staying sober are one thing. Getting sober and staying sober and losing the shame, losing the pain, you know, diminishing it. We never really lose it, but diminishing it makes me able to tolerate your pain. Uh, you know, once I've got my shame out of the way, I'm not so triggered by you being hurt by what I did. I mean, I'm still, uh, maybe I'll feel your pain with you instead of just feeling my pain and shame. And that well, was a ram ramble, but. <laughs> no, no, it was very clear. And, and I'll, I'll just reiterate this. I've said it before, getting sober and staying sober does not fix all your problems you have with relationships. It's not a cure-all. Um, so um, I guess it's, it's, if, if you look at recovery as I have to stop my acting out, then yeah, it ends up getting sober and whatever you have is what you get. If you look at recovery as this is my chance to provide for myself um, and to develop in the way that I should have been able to from the very beginning, that means there will be things that you address like you know, in an attuned relationship between a parent and child, kids learn how to deal with pain and discomfort because they have an attuned parent that helps them do that. Um, I, I think about 100% of the sex addicts that I work with had major like attunement, misattunement, and, and they didn't get a lot of that. Um, 
it's not an excuse. It's, it's a, after I get sober, then I need to work on this stuff that I didn't get and can't do because that's part of, that's part of the package deal of being a human being. Um, coming into my full potential means being able to ride any emotional state with a partner of my choosing because doing it together is way better for us than doing it alone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what do you do with the resentment that you have to do work, that you have to do work for something you didn't cause? I'm assuming this is from a betrayed partner. I understand why we both need to do the work, but I still fight with resentment over it and I'm not sure how I process an emotion like resentment. Yeah. First, first of all, the resentment is really normal. There's nothing wrong with you that you feel that. And there's nothing wrong with you that you feel it in a big way. And there's nothing wrong with you that you may feel it in such a big way. It's distracting from everything else. Now, to answer that question, I'm going to tell a little story from my life. Um, so I've been in and out of therapy for my entire adult life. And um most of the time I've been in therapy, my parents have known about it. Um, when I was in my early 20s and I went in, I remember my mom asking, um, are you in therapy? Is it my fault you're in therapy? And as, an, as a dutiful investment son at that point, I said, no, 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 it's just some personal stuff I have to work on. And then as I got healthier, and that question didn't come up every time, it would come up uh, other times. And, and I remember... It was a few years ago. She asked the same question. Well, was it my fault? And instead of saying yes or no, I said, listen, mom, here's the way I see it. Um, I have a garden. I had it from the very beginning. And it's my patch of soil. The only thing was when I was a kid, I, I didn't choose what got uh, planted in that garden. Um, oh, sorry. My computer wants to do some updates. Um, I didn't choose what got put in that garden. You and dad did and a culture did and all the people around me. And I said, uh, there was a point in my life where ownership or responsibility for what's in that garden changed. And where I'm at right now is, yeah, you and dad planted a bunch of stuff in my garden. And some of it I really love. A lot of it I don't. But the point is, it's my garden now. Um, and I'm going to tend to it in the way that works best for me. And I find that, you know, sitting back and watching this weed grow and just thinking about that shouldn't be here in the first place. And that blankety blank who put this there, I could do that day by day and it just gets bigger and more invasive and it takes over. Or I could say, I don't care how it got here because I don't want it here. And there's no going back. The seed is here. So I need to understand what this is. I need to understand how it works. And those of you who are gardeners will get this. Not every weed you have is best taken care of by just pulling it out. Some, some plants are actually designed to leave roots behind and you can never get it done pulling out. So you have to consider other things. You have to know the nature of the thing that's in your garden so that you can change it like you want. So it's counterintuitive, but actually the way you deal with resentment is you make the problem yours. Because in reality, it is. Even if you didn't cause it, the seeds are in your garden now. And you're the only one who can tend to your garden. Um, as a another mother and mesh man, um, I like that <laughs> the whole story, but I really like the garden analogy. Um, because, yeah, I, that's kind of how I feel about it. It's like, okay, this is my life now. I need to fix it. Um, yeah. I can sit here and poke blame all I want, but it's still and that, my life and I need to fix it. That I'll just say that was actually a really important phase for me to look at it and to feel the anger and sometimes hatred and sometimes just the sheer like insanity of, I can't believe I have to deal with this. That was an important phase, but um, it was a phase. And it's not like one day I woke up with a different perspective. I had to keep working on like, okay, why is this phase feeling the way that it's feeling? And it's because it's not, not done that's not complete um, that actually doesn't in the end move me to where i need to go even though it's an important place to stop if that makes sense yeah um this next question um it's long so i'm going to try and shorten it it's it's a couple and um he has started recovery he did the porn addiction work group and if you're struggling financially reach out to tammy um sometimes we do payment plans um for part two 
Um, we tried Fanos a few days ago. He got really defensive. Um, you know, he's not, he has a hard time calling his sponsor. He hasn't started with the CSAT. I'm not telling him to do it. I'm just asking if he's going to. Um, we had an issue come up last week. It's been swept under the rug, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I can't make him address these issues, but I'm trying to have clear and respectful communication. He says he feels stable in withdrawal and resentment. Um, um, he tells me he doesn't believe me. He doesn't believe my feelings. Um, what do we do here? Because it, this sounds like exactly what we're talking about. You yeah. Know? yeah, you know, every every one of these like early in recovery skills, it hinges on one perspective um, that you have to be able to get or none of this makes sense and none of it works. And that perspective is the person you're in a relationship with is a person and they have feelings and they have thoughts and they have perspectives. And guess what? It's not your job to litigate and find out whether those are uh, legitimate or not. If that's your mode for dealing with things, look back to how your parents dealt with your feelings. My guess is it was probably some, some way similar to that. Well, let me investigate and see if you should be feeling this or see if that's real. Um, feelings are not facts, but that doesn't mean that they're not valid. So when you have another person sitting across from you and they have feelings and perspectives, um, it's best if you can just take that at face value and say, okay, well, that's where you're at. Again, it's, it's like that inventory I was talking about. Here's what we're dealing with. Doesn't matter where it came from. Doesn't matter if we think it's real or valid or not. Um, because getting into that with each other, it's, it's just getting into this parent-child dynamic in your relationship. That's not even a good parent-child dynamic. It's really crappy parenting. Um, so as, as I'm looking at this, that's the underlying thing here is, um, when you and your partner sit down and talk together, do you get the feeling that both of you see another human being or do you see an adversary or do you see a machine that needs to be coded right? Or do you see an extension of you? Um, and there's really not an ability to move forward until there is mutual recognition. This is another human being and they shouldn't make sense to me intuitively. I have to do work to develop that understanding. So what do we do when one person is is at what are we going to do about this and the other person is not <laughs> on board with that statement yet? Yeah, you hold the line um, for as long as you can. I would understand if you got fatigued and say, you know what, this wee crap is crap and I'm going to look out for myself. Um, sometimes that happens. If you see any desire in yourself or any like, I want this relationship, you have to be able to come back to the we line. And um, this is where uh, marriage or relationship therapy is really helpful. Um, that may need to take a priority over some other things, especially if you have this dynamic where the focus now moves from, okay, what do I have to do with myself? I'm in recovery to my spouse is the source of all of my problems. Um, you may need to get into some relationship therapy to help challenge some of that and, and give perspective. Um, and you look at your own clock, I guess, for how long can I go without a glimmer of we. And there's some people I've worked with who legitimately, I don't, I don't think they have a clock there. It's, I'll keep doing this for as long as I take. And, and for other people, I've, I've literally seen people say, I've got seven more months. And then something needs to happen. And there's not a right or a wrong stance there. Um, again, that inventory is about what are we dealing with right now? And um, it's a two-person problem to fix. And anyone who doesn't think that way is not seeing it clearly. Um, at least when it comes to your relationship and what happens in your relationship. Um, individual recovery, it's, it's like they say in AA, um, you have to do this by yourself, but you won't do it alone. Um, there are aspects of individual recovery that absolutely have to be tackled by the individual, but the overall picture, the overall relationship, it's always a we deal. Thank you. 
Um, okay, next one here. Uh, my husband had a relapse according to my boundaries, but he says that according to his SA group, he is still sober because he did not masturbate. He just went on a webcam and paid for shows. Um, to me, this sounds crazy. Any thoughts? Uh, clearly, I agree with you. Um, it sounds to me like it's okay to watch porn as long as you do not masturbate. John, thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, don't make this a battle about my boundaries versus yours. You um, point out the craziness. So is that really what you and your group think recovery is, is you can watch porn as long as you don't masturbate? Yeah. And here's, here's where, so, so that's definitely distorted. If that's what the belief is, that's definitely distorted. And that needs to be worked out. Uh, another thing here, um, Relapses are not defined by a spouse's boundaries. It's different. The, the, for, for you, this would be, you know, it's not tenable for me to remain in a relationship or for me to, to think about going forward with you with full trust um, if you are doing the following. And I see all the times that someone's recovery plan does not overlap completely with their spouse's needs. And that's not necessarily a problem. Um, this again, this is very clearly not one of those cases where like, yeah, this wouldn't be on his recovery plan and that's fine. It should be, there's some denial there that needs to be addressed, but in general, going forward, be careful about my boundaries, define your relapses. It's my boundaries define what I can and can't do in a relationship. And if you're going to engage with this, um, I need to decide what my response is going to be. And there's so, there's so many ways to respond to this. There could be you know, I'm not dropping this until you've addressed it. Um, it could be, um, it's not safe for me for you to view porn at all. If you want that to be part of your life and you think that's part of healthy sexuality, God be with you, I won't be. Um, there, uh, so, so, so yeah, there's definitely distortion there. Um, but also just watch for that connection that you may have between my boundaries define your relapses. Um, that's, that's a road that, I mean, that, that can make you both crazy. So make, make sure your boundaries are about what you will and won't tolerate, not about what your partner will and won't do. Yeah, my boundaries are about me. They're not about John or anyone else. You know, my boundaries are about me keep staying safe from you and also not intruding upon you so that you could stay safe as well. Um, and I, I, SA, Sexaholics Anonymous, not my favorite of the 12 step groups, but um, for a lot of people, it is the correct group. Um, there is not an SA group on the planet that would sign off on what he just told you. Um, just, just for the record. Even. Um, even SA, so SA defines sobriety for you. Even in like SAA that doesn't find sobriety for you, I don't think there's an SAA group on the planet that would look at this and be like, yep, sounds sober. Yeah, no, it's, 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 um, yeah. Look, looking at porn is, is being sexual and cheating. Um, you know, if, if that's your relationship boundaries, there are relationships where it's okay to use porn, you know, just don't keep it secret or, you know, whatever. Well, that's both parties saying this right. works. It's not one party saying this is what I want. And the other one saying, right. I hate this. Yeah, it is a mutually agreed upon relationship boundary. This is clearly not a mutually agreed upon relationship boundary. And yep. the, the definition of sobriety in Sexaholics Anonymous is um, you may only be sexual with your spouse. Uh, they may have broadened that to long-term partner. Um, but um, that's it. No self, no sex with self, no looking, no <laughs> flirting, none of that stuff. There's also a really common misconception along a lot of people that if there's no orgasm, then it's not sexual. Right. And that, that should probably be looked at here too. Um, you, you can be very sexual without orgasm. And that's, right. that's not the line. Yeah. I mean, Bill Clinton, I did not have sex with that woman. Oh, Bill, <laughs> you know, let me tell you what you did because oh. that was pretty sexual. He, well, he did that a couple of times. Also, there was, I did not inhale. Yeah. yeah. So, and I like Bill. <laughs> Bill. 
Um, yeah, look, uh, Dr. Rob's definition of infidelity is the keeping of important sexual or romantic secrets from your primary partner. And yeah, I mean, going on a webcam, paying for shows, and you have to find out the hard way usually. I mean, that's that's cheating, I'm sorry. Um, clearly and, in your relationship, that's cheating. It's, it's, it is a boundary violation. And, you know, not, not to split hairs here, but I would also say like paying for something that's a, that's a whole different strata than just, yeah. you know, I, I went to a webcam site, like paying for something is another level of action, commitment, thought that either was there and you ignored or should have been there. Like pay, paying for sex is that th that's not a low level no. thing. Like that's, 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 that's pretty deep into it. It's an escalated behavior. Um, Good way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, hey, just with porn, I mean, most, most porn addicts, they start out just looking at really vanilla kind of stuff. And by the end it escalates and they're paying for it. And, you know, all of this stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> clearly uh, I hope we have validated your, whatever you're feeling right now, I hope we validated it for you. Cause yeah. Um, we'd be feeling the same way, both of us, clearly. Absolutely. So, um, thank you. We are out of time. John, great topic today. Um, everybody, I will get this posted. I'll try and get it up this afternoon because I'm sure some of you are going to want to revisit it. Um, anything you want to say to take us out, John? Thanks for coming, and I'll see you all in about a month. Yeah, we're not going to be here in two weeks. We will be here um, next month on our regular schedule. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody.